Dave Mason, thanks for joining us. Hey, hi, how are you? I'm I'm great. I uh, I just wanted to, uh, to let the audience know we got we got David Mason here from, uh, from Traffic from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, so you've had quite a career. So I'm I'm stoked to talk about it with you. Um, I was thinking it would be fun to, to start the interview uh, playing a clip from my dad. He's a he's a huge fan of you. Uh, he and his friends uh, listen to you all the time growing up. Um, so when uh, we told them we were interviewing you, uh, I said, well, do you want to say something to him? Uh, do you have any questions for him? And uh, he just kind of wanted to say thank you. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to play a quick clip of, of, uh, of him saying, giving you a shout out here. Okay. to say thank you thank you hi dave sean albert i just wanted to uh, get a chance to say thank you thank you so much for the music uh, you put out over the years uh, my friends and i really enjoyed it and when my son sean who told me he was going to be interviewing you today i just had to uh, say could please let me say hello to dave and and thank him you really made uh, growing up in the uh, 70s uh very enjoyable, a, a lot more enjoyable than it would have been without your music. So thank you so much for that. Uh, my friends and I uh, would listen to your music uh, at all the, the house parties and uh, uh, growing up in the Midwest. Uh, it was uh, it kept us warm during those uh, cold winter months. So thanks again and uh, uh, good luck with the, your future music. Uh, it's, it sounds like uh, you're going to be going uh, and rocking for many years to come. So uh, keep up the great work and uh, have a great uh, holiday season. Take care. All right, there it is. <laughs> Very cool. Nice. So do you, you know, Thank you for me. You've been you've been doing this since the uh, you know since the seventies, like my dad said, who grew up in Chicago. Um, I've been doing this since the sixties. Since the sixties, that's right. And uh, do you? How often do you get people like that through the decades? You know, just coming up to you and thanking you for your music or, or fanning out. A lot. <laughs> I was. I, I mean, you've 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 had an incredible career playing with with, with huge musicians. Uh, huge musician yourself. Uh, but why don't you just take us all the way back and, and let us know how you got into music to begin with? Um, how I got into it? Yeah. Do you remember if like your parents liked it music? Do you remember if there was maybe an older brother or something like that who, who inspired you to pick up an instrument or, or join uh, a band? No, there's nobody in my in my family that was a, there were a bunch of hams, but nobody was a, um, musical uh it just i guess basically it to be honest it just seemed like a great idea and i really wasn't going to be working nine to five i figured that out after three or four jobs and so <laughs> i guess it was it was you know it was either that or some life of of devious crime of some kind, I suppose. I don't know. Right. <laughs> Just, do, you do you remember some of those initial moments uh, when you were putting traffic together and uh, and how that uh, story played out? The traffic, just that, that's, Jim Capote and I were, uh, you know, we had bands together. In, in uh, he grew up about 10 miles away from me in Evesham. And we had a couple of bands, of Deep Feeling, the Hellions, uh, made a record with the Hellions, and the Hellions <laughs> would play, you know, pretty re just regional stuff. So we play in Birmingham a lot, which is where Spencer Davis Group was from. So that's basically where we met Steve. It was in Birmingham, the place called the I believe it was at the Elbow Room, which is a sort of after hours, um, semi-private club had music, food drinks <laughs> so i think and then basically we just we all developed a relate like jim and i like i said we already had one but that's how essentially just hap started to happen that way with the four of us a lot of eclectic musical tastes all and, and a lot of the same musical tastes just hanging out getting yeah. high, smoking a lot of hash listening to <laughs> <laughs> right 
listening to music, <laughs> figuring what, what the hell, you know, what we were young. I was 18 years old. What did I care? It was, you know, there's no marriage, no kids, no nothing. Just Sure. Just go for it. Do you remember if there were any kind of key moments when you were, when you guys were just getting started where you were like, okay, that was kind of a turning point uh, for us. And, you know, that really kind of got the ball rolling for traffic. Well, traffic, it, it, traffic was going to be successful one way or another because of Winwood. I mean, it's, you know, they, they already had, he already had three major hit records. Right. Well, four, I mean, more than that, if you can't, what was happened in England. But at that point, you know, give me some loving and I'm a man with huge hits here in the U.S., which I sang on anyway, on I'm a man and give me some loving. And one other hit they had, somebody helped me. So we kind of been goofing around before traffic started. Um, so it had, it was going to happen one way or another. You know, it was sort of, <laughs> it was a built in given based on that. This just wasn't, wasn't just an unknown entity coming out of nowhere, you know. Right, you guys already felt like you had the the momentum. You were you already knew, hey, if we, if we keep doing this, Winwood already had the momentum. So it was, it was a question of what are we going to put out there? You know, it wasn't a question of was anybody going to pay attention. And sure, they, they were, but it was what the hell was Winwood doing, leaving a very successful band, starting up um, this with three unknowns. Right. After you you went off and, and did your own thing, uh, you know how was that? Did because you you had you know, well, but before we even get into that, uh, you know, I, I did want to talk about you know one of your biggest hits ever, "Feeling All Right," um, which you know still to this day you hear in films and TV commercials, and uh, you know it's been covered by Joe. Joe Cocker, Grand Funk Railroad, Yellow, or even more recently, Coldplay. Um, How does it feel when you when you hear some of these more modern bands cover your stuff or, or see it pop up in modern movies? Do you get a kick of that, out of that? Uh, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, funny just to give you a you know an idea of the scope or to, to the listeners the idea of a, the scope of of the generations your music has spanned you know my dad wanted to say hey and say thank you for your music uh but my nephew who's uh you know i think he's in seventh grade or something like that he said he said oh uh they have a, a song in uh, the guardians of the galaxy uh <laughs> soundtrack um so you know you you've got you know people my age my nephew's age and, and my father's age listening to your music all through these decades um how was it playing with some of these just massive people i mean i i know you're you're a giant among the giants um but uh you know i i know you must have got a kick out of you know recording with paul mccartney or the rolling stones um sure. how is it getting in the room with some of those guys well a lot of that stuff happened um pretty much back in england um um, since, uh, you know, basically, really, there was only one central place where everybody was going to be, maybe all of them at the same time sometimes, and that would be London, because that's where everybody, that was the center of everything, that's where the studios were, what, what, how, what few there were, so everybody was using the same ones, clubs, the same thing, you had, a little handful of, of semi-private after-hour places that, you know, the McCartney, Stones, Hendrix, or we could go to and hang out and not be bothered <coughs> um, and not be, you know, constantly dealing with fans or something. Um, so you were going to run into all these people somewhere is how it really worked. Um, and then we were all using the same studios same engineers so sessions would overlap you know oh hey hi <laughs> check out what would you know so it was kind of very it was very easy for it to all mix up yeah i imagine so it, that's it, really the opportunities and you know hendrix just i sat i guess i sat down with him in the speakeasy one night he was sitting there by himself and just started talking he was, he was a fan of traffics 
And we just started, you know, we developed, I developed somewhat of a relationship enough to spend time hanging out with him enough to um, record with him. I, you know, playing the acoustic guitar on Watchtower on Electric Ladyland and singing on Crosstown Traffic. And there's some other tracks that I did with him playing the sitar and bass, but I have no idea what happened. And then uh, the others were, were pretty much similar, you know. Um, it, was, it was a, um, I mean, the whole period of time in the 60s, um, in a lot of places, but certainly in London, was, um, was yeah, it was it was pretty interesting. It was I don't know where you I don't know if you could it would recreate again at all. Yeah, I think it's a it's a once in a multiple lifetimes, you know, yeah, time. It, you know, it's it's a lot of things all coming together all at once after a very, you know, after a very turbulent, you know, nearly ten years or more of 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 world conflict, it's, it's not that long afterwards you know, that, that starts to happen. But the, but the thing about it is, is that musically, I mean, essentially all we were doing was copying what was being done here in America. You know, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the hits for English bands were, um, were hits that were, were happening over here and they were, somebody would get it and they, some English band would quickly co cover it, do their version of it, and they never hit. And so we were, you know, we had we were listening to all that music, and then you have to remember that here in America, during that period, radio you had segregated radio. Okay, so in Europe, growing up, we didn't have that. There wasn't there was no segregated radio. It was just music. It was just, you know, that's a really interesting point that I haven't heard before, uh, because I just had a conversation um, yesterday uh, with kind of a, a music enthusiast, historian, popular uh, radio DJ in, uh, in Los Angeles. And, and we were talking about that, you know, that British invasion kind of music and how, uh, you know, a lot of that, that was coming from the American blues, uh, you know, rooted with, uh, you know, which, and, blues, gospel, country. You name it, everything but everything but but real country music, Appalachian music, which is European roots. Right. It, it all comes from here. It's all American. It's all uniquely American music. You know? especially, sure. Especially jazz and the blues and gospel and R and B. You know, it's and we were listening to all that shit. So. Right, but and but the point you brought up about. Uh, the segregation of radio in in America and the fact that that wasn't a thing in Britain, uh, I think that's that's a really interesting point that I haven't really made as far as reasons why, uh, you know, maybe that music became so big over Britain and then you guys kind of fed it back to us through the British filter, um, which could then be played on probably radio stations. Well, we uh, turned you back onto your own music, on, which, you know. I mean, exactly. the Beatles' first album has got covers on it. Sure. You know, so it's like, I'm going to be playing over the white stations. Well, wait a minute. There's, oh, oh, they did. Oh, this is cool. Here's the original version. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, you get turned on. So, yes, absolutely. But, but that's a big difference. We didn't have that. You know, also, you know, you were not that we had much radio when you know <laughs> growing up all i had was the bbc which mm. trust me was just you know that's just government run radio and then you got you know another tv stage atv an independent tv channel commercial and then you got the radio state and then if you wanted to really get into listening to stuff you 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 pick up radio luxembourg which was the, which is also the armed forces, which is Ameri again American, the Arm American Armed Forces Service, and they'd be playing all that music too. So, you know, we had access to all that, and so the blues and all that stuff, which 
which essentially starts with someone uh, with basically, I mean, actually Chris Barber was very influential um, in starting that whole thing and the skiffle, Ronnie Donegan, and then, then the blues and more into the, and yeah, there, there'd be no Eric Clapton if there wasn't for, you know, B.B. King, Albert King, Freddie King, <laughs> and the rest of them. Sure, Elvis, the Beatles, Rolling Stones, um, they all credit the, uh, the you know, the African-American uh, blues artists from America, so. Well, so for, the, certainly for a lot of the English bands, you know, I mean, for sure, there's no question about it. Right. Yeah. Ain't nothing but a hound dog. Big Mama Thornton. Um, that, that was a cover. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, just mentioned that the other day. So. So, yeah, that's that's a really interesting point. And um, I, 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 I think that's something I, I'd never heard of. Um, but it, uh, it definitely explains uh, why British people may have been so much more receptive to that music um, sooner. And, and then kind of, you know, as, as you said, kind of fed it back to us, <laughs> turned us on, turned us back on to our own music, you know? Really? Yeah, absolutely. So growing up with those guys or coming up with those guys, uh, do a lot of those guys uh, seem, as, do a lot of them match the portrayal that they, that they get in the media? You know, is, is, is Paul the happy go lucky one? Is John kind of the, the more introverted, serious one is, <laughs> is Mick kind of, you know, kind of crazy and then uh, Keith even crazier? Well, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know. I just, I mean, I just worked with them. I'm not close. I'm not close friends with them. most of those people. Numbers you're talking years ago. Sure. <laughs> Back when I was a teenager. Any, any. Uh, I haven't really seen any of those people since. You said you had a bit of a relationship with um, Jimi Hendrix, which is amazing. Um, do you do you have any fond memories uh, of him from from when you guys were hanging out back then? Yeah, I mean, we I spent, we listened to you know Albert King. We he loved Albert King, and we both shared that little thing. Just you know, we just sit around playing records, listening to stuff. Right. Yeah. So uh, you, you you recently uh, re-released. Uh, well, you you did a couple of new re re-releases uh, recently. Uh, you you re-recorded "Alone Together," which uh, was your first solo album, which which I want to talk right. about. Right. Um, but, but you also uh, re-recorded um, uh, "All Right," uh, which uh, you know, oh, as we yeah, mentioned before, is uh, your- yeah. I, well, that was more for a. Uh, um, I did, but I was using the song to be able to do. It was a ve- it was a vehicle to be able to make it easy to put all those people together. Mm. Nice, yeah. Tell us a little bit about the people you brought together there to re-record that because you had quite the uh, quite the crew. Uh, well, I put some I wanted to put somebody together just for you know um, just to put something out there because uh, and I was thinking, well, you know what. What's the- Sit here with an acoustic guitar and do that. It's a bit more. I think we'll do something a little cooler than that. Um, and then I saw the um, and trying to play live with a lot of with people in very different locations. Um, you don't get the greatest um, quality with it. With it, it, there's a lot of latency. In yeah, it. sure. So. Uh, I saw the um, uh, old Blackwater um, Doobie Brothers video. Really mm. cool. If you haven't seen it. Uh, and what they did, and it was them all in different. And I'm like, okay, how did you guys do this? This is, sounds too, it looks too good and it sounds too good, but it, <laughs> it looks great. Uh, and I said, well, we, you know, we all, I recorded the song, everybody did it live, and then they, you know, on iPhones, film themselves, singing to themselves what they've just done so that they, we had it separated and then it was, you know, edited together. Right. So I was like, oh, okay. So that's where I started, which was with John McPhee, who explained to me how they did this. And then John was very instrumental in getting, I said, well, do you think you could get all the other, get, I just want to show Pat's okay, do you think Tommy, 
would be part of this. It's, here's what I'm thinking of doing. Uh, Mick, I've known, you know, I was in Fleetwood Mac for two years and I've known Mick a long time. Yeah. We're, and we both, at the moment, we're, we're pretty much neighbors over here on Maui. So, um, Michael McDonald, I kind of got to know him via uh, some events that have happened the last four years here on Maui at New Year's, which we both, which we've done. Um, and Sammy, I met him last Christmas here on Maui. Uh, and I was going to, he asked me if I'd do a, um, a benefit thing for him. Uh, I think it was in, was it going to happen in February, but then COVID happened. <laughs> and that got canceled. So I just basically called everybody and said, hey, here's what I'm thinking of doing. Will you guys be up for being into doing this? this you know, I don't know how it's going to turn out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, if we're into it, cool, whatever, it's sure. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and you have to understand, dealing with artists is like herding cats sometimes, okay? So just because they said yes, it didn't mean to say it was actually going to get done or this year are going to get done. But, you know, as it worked out, it just, um, um, Michael was the first one. He put the piano down on this little rough track I mapped out. And then Mick put drums on it. And then we built the track up. And then um, Rob Arthur, who actually played keyboard with um, Peter Frampton for a while, who's actually become a very good film editor, um, he, he put the video together. So Dave Mason and the Quarantines went out. And yeah, I was, the quarantines. And basically, I wanted to go out there just to give people a little, you know, just to feel good. And it yeah. definitely is a feel good song. Yeah, just and something to make a little smile feel good. And then on the end of it, we put, put a tag to donate to, um, to Music Cares, which is a organization for that helps a lot of, you know, <clears throat> the, there's a very small little percentage of, of, of artists that are in that, you know, stupid earning bracket. <laughs> then there's the, you know, there's another layer, but the majority of people, we're all working, they're all working musicians. You know, it's how, it's how they make their living. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> there's that, as much as everybody goes, oh, music, it just poof, it just, Magic just came out of nowhere. Cool, we'll take that. You know, it is somebody's living. They have to create it. So sure. people that way. So music cares. Basically, when this COVID hit, you know, we are going to be some of the last people going back to work. And yeah. all, and all of those that support us, i.e., road crews and such, and so on. And so Music Cares steps up and helps them financially with things. And at the time I put this out, um, they were already, you know, they were already pretty much broke in helping people. Wow. So I put that on the end of it, uh, hoping people would go and donate to that, uh, that cause. Because they're, they're really good, actually. That yeah, that's awesome and, and so true. Um, you know, cause even as things start to open up or or in some cases start to close down again and open back up, um, you're right. Musicians, you know, those large gatherings uh, for entertainment are, are are kind of the most questionable as far as when they're actually going to come back. So, so thanks for your contribution on that and uh, and feeling all right. I mean, you. Oh. It's, you know, decades old now. You wrote that when you were, what, a teenager still? 19. Right. Do you remember what, uh, what inspired, you know, just that, that, that good feeling that you were feeling when you wrote that? It's not a good feeling. That's the part. <laughs> That's not what the song is about. So feeling all right is the, 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 the song is, is it's feeling all right with a question mark. It's a question. Hmm what the song is about. The song is about not feeling too good myself. That's what the song is about. There you go. So that was that was the was that some teenage angst or was it what was going on in the world or all the above? Quite a love affair. Let's see you know, just another <laughs> <laughs> it always is, right? <laughs> so yeah, but it, but it's but it's but but it's the way I wrote it and what it's really about 
is feeling all right is a question mark. Do you feel all right? Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not feeling too good myself at all. So that's what the song's about until, until basically Joe Cocker got a hold of it and did what he did to it, which turned it into something else, which is just fine with me. It's, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's an easy tune to do. I mean, if there's, if it's, there's two, there are two chords in the whole song. You can't, you, you can't screw it up. Yeah. And Joe Cocker, he has a way of, uh, really making a song is out well, <laughs> that well that piano part is such a big hook is it the piano part on joe's thing is, is as big a hook as the damn song is what I say. right right well it's amazing how you know songs can be interpreted and they really do mean different things to different people um it's it's uh the person who wrote it could have a completely different idea of what it means to somebody else um you know, it's get, probably probably given some people, you know, some good vibes during this quarantine. But <laughs> originally it was. I hope so. I mean, that's OK. It can be feeling all right. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. So I wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, you you have re-recorded your first um, solo release, which is Alone Together. Um and this is quite a story because it's it's nearly what fifty years later after you initially released it. Um, but it was basically you were you're kind of saying I didn't really like the way my vocals sounded on the original. I, I feel like it, they weren't how I imagined. So so tell us a little bit about why you why you did it and my uh, and the vocals are never going to be how I imagined. My vocals I want to be Sam Cooke. I want to be Marvin <laughs> Gaye. I want to be. <laughs> And that's never going to happen. So, but yeah, best part of it. Uh, and the other part was I just started fooling around with some stuff um, four or five years ago. That World in Changes was totally a departure from the original version, which I put on this on this new. The only the only song I really just totally changed. Uh, the others are, pr are pretty true to the original arrangements. Um, and then that, and I just started fooling around with it. And about three, four years ago, we had some time off um, on the road. And so I took the band, we went to the studio one afternoon and basically cut all the tracks live for what mm -hmm. would be alone to for, for the songs I'm alone together. So we did that in an afternoon and I just sat on them for three, four years. <clears throat> and then um, and then the the other impetus was the uh, Universal Fire, where all the original masters, you know, they're they lost in that fire. So the original masters are gone. Not that oh. they don't have digital copies. I'm sure they do, uh, obviously. But the masters are gone. And it was coming up on 50 years. And so it was, well, shoot, you know, why not? Yeah. I'm just doing it for my own amusement anyway, for God's sake. If people, yeah. don't, if people will like it, great. If they don't. And plus, the fact of the matter is, you know, like you're saying with the age groups of people that like music and your nephew with, oh, well, I know who that is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there, there just there isn't any old music. It's just either cool or it's good or it isn't. Sure. I would venture to say if you played alone together what I've just done to a group of 17, 16, 18 year olds, 15 year olds, a good percentage of them are going to go, oh, wow, who's that? Yeah. Is this a new act? Who is <laughs> Yeah, yes. Yeah. He's, he's new. <laughs> You're, uh... He just came on the scene after 50 years. He's just been. <laughs> well, as a uh, as a former member of Fleetwood Mac, uh, and you know, living next to uh, your neighbor, um, they know more than ever. I don't know if you've <laughs> if you're up on uh, TikTok, that social oh, media platform. I, I, I know that, yes. But dreams as as blown up uh, due to that, and and I, I think the same thing with Journey. Yeah, you know, it, they were uh, the song was on that show that was basically a young audience and just boom. But that's the problem is that the way things are in the music business and, the, and radio, 
which is still a very powerful format. Sure. It ain't all about the internet. <laughs> true, very true. Is there is no outlet anymore to expose and to bring that kind of thing together. There's no, <laughs> check this out here, check this out, check this out, check this out. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I was having a conversation just a couple days ago, and it was kind of the realization that uh, you could choose any one of your songs, uh, you especially, uh, Dave, and choose any one of your songs from the past 50 years or whatever, and just be like, I'm going to start uh, promoting this song. <laughs> you, you know, you could start putting ads for it, you could make some new material, make some social posts about it. And boom, you'll probably get some attention. And especially with your platform, it'll, you know, who knows? It could be, it could chart again, you know? <laughs> like, it's a, it's a crazy realization that uh, although radio is still highly influential, as you mentioned, um, really, if, if someone hasn't heard your song, it's new to them. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it, if, it, if, it, if it's good, it's good. It doesn't matter when, you know? I mean, <laughs> you know... Beethoven, Bach, they were good when they did it, and it's still good, and it's still what it is. It, it's, a, it's a long time ago. Right, right. So uh, what, I, what I found interesting was, uh, well, you, you told me a little bit about it, because I, I read that initially, you were like, hey, I don't, I wasn't, I never really was fully satisfied with how my how my vocals sounded. So I'm going to re-record this, but you, you re-recorded everything, you know, you, you got a band together and re-recorded all the instrumentation. Um, What's interesting about it also is, you know, uh, talking about making old music new again is uh, now are those are those your masters now? So now you have the masters because if if, oh, if no, no, no. I'm the, do I we I'm we years past the re-recording restrictions. Mm, oh, okay. On that stuff or anything that I've ever done. I mean, it's 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 a good <laughs> it's a good the amount of time has passed either right. way. And I can do that. So yeah, no, I mean, I for, for what for what it, that means anymore. Yes, I own the masters. Right. Yeah, I didn't even. Uh, that was something I was unaware of that they included in in contracts that you couldn't re-record. So that's that's a that's a well, pretty it, tight contract. It was a time restriction. Mm. Right. A time period between when it expires, which I, I something like ten years or something. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I know that was a strategy Taylor Swift recently employed. She wanted to re-record her her mass some some of her older tracks because she was displeased with the current owners of her old masters. <laughs> so she wanted to uh, to re-record them. But uh, but Dave, so you've had an amazing career, still going strong, obviously, still releasing new music, still re-recording old old hits. Um, how did it feel to be inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Was that was that did, did that move you in a certain way? Did, did that hold weight for you? Uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, it, you know, I guess, I mean, it basically it's the industry patting itself on the back, you know, it's, it's, it's and you could say, Hey, it's, you know, it, it took you long enough. Mm. I mean, there's still, I mean, the dupe is just got, for Christ's sake. Mm -hmm. I mean, people sure. get in there, I have to look and go, huh? Right. No, <laughs> definitely. In the wrong, <laughs> wrong thing. Um, so it's, you know, I mean, it was, it's okay. It's great. You know, a nice, you know, platinum or gold watch would have been good after all this. <laughs> uh -huh. Bit of a statue, but. <laughs> right. <laughs> and but you know and plus with the, the situation with traffic was with the with that name is just with winwood basically it's just screwed with him so you know that was a whole fiasco um was turned into a major fiasco mm -hmm. and um so it was it was a bunch of mixed shit the only thing that was great i think for frankly of having seen not seen but looked at the lineup of a lot of those rock and roll hall of fame shows that they keep putting up you know yeah i think it's probably one of the best at least from my point of view lineups of any show that uh, night that uh, i think i mean it was uh, the prince 
Yeah. Traffic, ZZ Top, Jackson Brown, um, and uh, Bob Seger. Wow, that is quite a lineup. That was the evening's music. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, the, the, yeah, for me, regardless of the rest of it, that was worth it for that. Sure. Just for that. It's just an epic gig that you got that you played, you know. <laughs> Prince, who started the whole damn thing off, was I mean, just awesome. He's crazy, or he was crazy, you know. Yeah, I mean, just <laughs> the show the thing. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. I'm not sure if it was the same one because I've seen him, I think, perform at multiple uh, Hall of Fames. But there was one where he uh, he performed with, I think. I think Tom Petty was on stage and um, I think uh, George Harrison's son might have been on stage. I think it might have been a George Harrison tribute. Did you ever see that performance? It was epic. He threw his guitar up in the air at the end of his solo and then it just disappeared. <laughs> I was like, where did it go? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I've seen that one. I think that was from the album The Hole, I think. Right. But anyway, so yeah, but otherwise it was... Um, <laughs> Musically, it was a great evening. The rest of it was a political, not, you know, joke, no nightmare. Uh huh. Well, aside from kind of formal industry recognition, you've you've had some pretty, um, you know, monumental recognition from some fellow legends like Eric Clapton. He said that he thinks you have a fantastic touch, and he loves the way you play guitar, and thinks your songs are great. Is that uh, is that kind of feedback maybe a little more valuable from your fellow artists? Um, well, yeah, I mean, absolutely, sure. I mean, it's, it, it, I mean, it's always nice to get some recognition from your peers um, and those around you. Um, uh, but if, but 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 some kind of recognition for your work from you know any source, I guess is. <laughs> is always welcome sure well dave it's uh it's been truly an honor to to speak with you um get get to speak with a legend like you and, and hear some of your awesome stories um we like to end the interview by asking if you had one piece of advice for aspiring artists what would it be <laughs> good luck <laughs> <laughs> uh that's the best that's the best <laughs> advice i've got <laughs> um <laughs> Um, you know, I don't, you know, I guess, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't really matter what it is you do, but the only thing I can offer is that I, 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 I think you need to really have a passion for, I mean, and I mean, you know, sometimes to the exclusion of, of everything else around you. Sure. Bordering on what appears at times to be completely one selfish son of a bitch. <laughs> but if you want to really do it and get there, then that's, you, that's what it takes. And I would assume at this point, not that it didn't when I started, it's just that you need to get out there and play in front of people. Because if you've got something, they'll pick up on it. One, right. will turn it. one will turn into two, two will turn into six, six will turn into 20, 20, and so on and so on. So, I mean, that's the really the, you know, the only bit of passion. You got you, you to really want it. Because <laughs> there ain't, you know, there's no safety net here. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> I like your initial advice of good luck, <laughs> but, I, but I also I also you know, but you know, secondary to that is if uh, if you are going to make it, you really got to be passionate enough to be. It sounds like what you're saying is obsessive about it a little bit, and uh, you you know, I mean, I was when I think back, I mean, yeah, I slept on basement floors, I you know, whatever it was. <laughs> right right it's you know it's funny they say artists uh, are selfish uh but uh you know sleeping on basement floors and all that you know that's kind of 
selflessness um so that you can do the art you know um so it's uh, it goes and to be and to be good at anything there's a degree of that that you have to be whether you're an athlete too same thing Bring it back for you.